Okay, so our meme. This has been interesting lately because this is about the new age basically. And so I went through a couple of these because a lot of the stuff people talk about as Christians talk about this and they don't realize that there's something wrong with this. We always say karma when something happens to somebody, right? But karma is actually, it's not of God, it's actually something that comes from Buddhism or Hinduism. It's that religion. It actually means, the word actually means action. And the idea with karma is if it's cause and effect. If you do something good, something good will happen to you. You do something bad, something bad will happen to you. You know, that's not really true, is it? I mean, you and I live in a sinful world. Sometimes we do good things and bad things happen to us. But that idea of karma is from, it's not nothing to do with Christianity. I mean, Galatians 6, 7 tells us this. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. And people do mock God. For whatsoever a man soweth or does, that she will also reap. So it is true that, you know, if you are an alcoholic and you drink every day, you're going to ruin your liver, right? And, and other things like that, too. So whatsoever a man soweth, that she also reap. For if he sows to the flesh, of the flesh reap corruption. But he sows to the spirit, shall of the spirit reap ever life everlasting. So the truth is, um, it does matter how we live as Christians. But that idea of karma is something different altogether. The idea with karma, if you do good, when you come back in your reincarnation, you will come back as something better, okay? <laughs> so, that's the whole idea with karma. It's, it's reincarnation. And so it's it's idea of your destiny. Now, that idea here that says, but he so to the Spirit, shall the Spirit reap everlasting. John 6, verse 63 tells us this. It is a spirit that quickens or gives life to the flesh. Um, gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto, they are spirit, they are life. So you're saved by faith in Christ, right? Then you, sir, you, you live as the spirit leads you. It's not that if you are so into the spirit, you're going to become saved. No, that's not what that's saying. But you serve as, as a Christian, you live for Christ. Hey, God's going to take care of you. The words of the spirit, they are life. Actually, John 6, verse 64 says, if you believe not, you know, you, you're unsaved, obviously. So it's talk, John 6 is talking about salvation. But here, Galatians 6, 7, and 8, as far as a Christian, you know, it does matter how we live. God, God does keep track of us, but the truth is, you know many times you've done good things and bad things have happened to you, haven't you? And you've seen people that do bad things and good things happen to them. That's the world we live in. This karma garbage is not true. That's from the New Age, and it's being Christian, Christianity's buying into this, a lot of this New Age stuff today. So the next one is praying to the universe. And the idea is that the, there's a force out there, and it's universe, you pray to it, and it'll answer you. Well, you know what, what does the Bible say? The Bible says in Matthew 6, 9, after this manner, therefore pray you to, pray you, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Who are we to pray to? We all know this. I grew up every, almost every Sunday in a Lutheran church here in this, this verse, you know, <laughs> uh, the Lord's Prayer. But pray to you, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. We pray to God, the Father, the creator of the universe. It's not that we should pray to the universe like it's some, com some kind of force out there, but that's what the New Age believes. And then the third one here is feeling someone's energy. It's like, I feel your energy. And you know what? We've got to be very careful about feelings. Proverbs 3, 5, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding, right? Sometimes I can put forward something, and you may think that everything's okay, but deep down inside, there may be something really bothering me. And the same with you, too. And this idea of energy is new age also. So that's something we really have to be careful about also. Then this another one, wishing someone good luck. You know, we all say that. We grew up saying good luck, good luck, good luck. But you know what? Like I said, here in Isaiah 48, verse 8, The grass withereth, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. So the truth is, um, these things come and go, don't they? I mean, these good vibes. I mean, sometimes you'll feel good. Sometimes you won't feel so good. Somebody says something nice to you. You feel good. Otherwise, you don't feel so good. And it's just feelings. It's we, our feelings are fleeting. They fool us, don't they? And it's, you got to be careful about that because feelings come and go. But God's words you can always trust on. And then Isaiah 40, verse 8, you know, in James, it says pretty much the same thing in the verse in James. 
So the next one is, um, and you wish it some, first of all, you wish it somebody good luck. It's like you say to somebody, hey, everything works out for you. That, there's nothing wrong with that necessarily, but there's no such thing as luck in this world, is there? The truth is, God's in control of everything. And so, I'm not saying somebody says good luck to somebody that they're saying something bad, because we're really not even thinking of that when we say it. But it's something that we got to realize that, hey, luck is not some kind of magical force that changes something. So the next one here is Mother Nature, not of God. Um, I think I jumped ahead. So Matthew 5, verse 45 says that you may be the children of Father which is in heaven, for it makes the sun to rise on the evil and on the good, and sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So wishing someone good luck, that one should have went with that one. Uh, it rains on the good and it rains on the bad, right? You and I can be outside and it will be raining on us just as like it will rain on anybody else. It will sunshine on the good, it will sunshine on the bad. We live in what's called a sin-filled world. So the last one there, Mother Nature, not of God, is this one. Genesis 8, verse 21 and 22. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, now this is after Noah's ark, I would not again curse the ground any more for man's sake, for the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done, while the earth remains, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night shall not cease. That verse, Genesis 8, 28, 8, 22, refutes these people that are climate change advocates. They're saying, we're ruining our climate, we're ruining our climate. But here it tells us, who's in, who's in control of the climate? God is. God says, cold and heat, summer and winter, day and night shall never cease. God's in control of all of that. And so the people that talk about this as climate change, I mean, they don't understand that God's in control. But anyways, Mother Nature, there's no such thing as Mother Nature, is there? I mean, God's in control. God created everything. God created all of this that happens with the weather, the good and the bad. So um, mixing the Bible with New Age religion won't get you to heaven. Jesus Christ is the only way, the only truth, and the only life. No man gets to the Father but by him. Stop mixing this worldly garbage with the Word of God. And this is many liberal churches that don't really believe the Bible. You hear stuff like this all the time. You really will. And so that's, I just wanted to put this out there just to kind of remind us about this. So let's go ahead and look at next is our prophecy update. And we've talked about the rapture, and I mention the rapture all the time, but I just want to go through this real quick. I'm not going to do it in-depth in this. I got this actually from Andy Wood, and this is a list of different verses. That's that verse sheet that you have. And I want to go through these real quick because today there's a movement going around saying that if you believe in the rapture, you are crazy, and you're being brainwashed because somebody told you to believe in the rapture, and it's not true. That's what's being told today. And so, I want to look at this real quick. But first of all, why should we believe in the rapture? I mean, there's, there's this saying, which is, almost sounds funny, but I don't like it. They say you should pray for the pre-trib rapture, but prepare for the uh, post-trib rapture. Isn't that kind of dumb when you think about it? I mean, you don't pray for that. It's, it's what does the Bible say? And so, here's the thing, the tribulation. The tribulation purpose concerns Israel. The tribulation is going to come upon this world. We know that. We study that in Genesis. I'm not Genesis. Revelation chapter 6 through chapter 19 is the tribulation. But Jeremiah chapter 30 verse 7, as you see in your sheet, and it says, Alas, for the day is great so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. Now who do you think Jacob is? It's talking about Israel. But he shall be saved out of it. Israel will be shaved, saved out of it. Did you know, according to um, Zechariah 13, 8, one-third of the Jews will be saved? And I've mentioned that before. Actually, Isaiah 41, verse 8 through 20, says the, Israel, the Jewish people will be preserved, the remnant. Romans 11, 5 says there's a remnant according to grace. And Isaiah 10, verse 20 through 23, says it from the house of Jacob. So the tribulation mainly deals with the Jewish people. And yes... The, after the rapture, all the Christians will be gone, and only the unsaved will be in this world. So, we know, oops, we know that Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, it says 70 weeks. Now, 70 weeks is 70 times 7, 
That week, word weeks means seven. It's Shabuah. That means 490. So it's referring to 490 years. We're not going to go through that now, but if you compare this, you see 490 years. That is dealt upon Israel because of the things that they did. And so they fulfilled 483 of these. So there's seven years left that Israel has to complete. That's a seven-year tribulation. So 70 weeks are determined upon thy people in thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy and anoint the most holy. So there is a 70th week. Seven, they call it the 70th week of Daniel, which is seven years still to come upon this world, and that's called the tribulation, as we see there in Jeremiah 30, verse 7. Now here's a, so the tribulation is for the Jewish people, not for the church. The church will be gone. We won't be there. So, and here's the thing that's interesting. This next one I want you to look at. It says here, no biblical reference to the church on earth during the tribulation period. This is a good one to know. Revelation chapter 3, verse 22 it says, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. In Revelation chapter 1, for Revelation chapter 3, it refers to churches 19 times. 19 times in the first three chapters of the book of Revelation. But from Revelation 4 all the way to the very last chapter, the church is not mentioned once. Now we talk about the tribulation as Revelation 6 through 19, right? It never mentions a church until Revelation 22, verse 16. And this is what Revelation 22, 16 says. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. So this book, Revelation, was written for us to understand it. We in the churches today, we're to know this book. But it, th this doesn't talk about the church being in the tribulation at all when you go from Revelation chapter 4 through Revelation chapter, actually through chapter 21. But the tribulation time period is 6 through 19. It's not even mentioned. So when people say the church will be in a tribulation, you can say, why is it not even mentioned in the tribulation time period? Because it's not. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, church is promised an exemption from divine wrath. In 1 Thessalonians 1, 10, it says, and to wait for his son from heaven. Some people like to say, well, that's talking about you dying. Well, no. Are you waiting to die? <laughs> no, you, you're waiting for Jesus Christ. Uh, Titus 2.13, which is in the present tense, it says Jesus is our blessed hope, and we're waiting for him because he's coming back for us. So we wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. The wrath to come. Like I said on Sunday, hell is a present wrath. If you die without Christ right now, you're going to go into what's called Hades torture, which is eventually going to be cast into the lake of fire, according to Revelation 20, verse 14. But the wrath to come is talking about the tribulation. Now, there's three wraths in this world, right? Human, we have wrath upon each other, don't we? We know that. People do things to each other. They have wars. They have battles. There's also Satan's wrath that comes upon this world also all the time, isn't there? So there's Satan's wrath, and sometimes we have things that happen to us and we don't even know for sure if that's Satan effect doing things to us or not. Sometimes you could say, well, I'm pretty sure Satan is attacking me at this time. But anyways, there's Satan's wrath, there's man's wrath, there's God's wrath. God's wrath is never to be put upon the church, okay? God's wrath is basically, hell was created for what? The devil and his angels. It wasn't created for mankind. The only reason mankind goes to hell is because they reject Christ. It wasn't created for them, for the devil and the angels. Now, that, I was thinking about this because I talk about Calvinism once in a while. They'll say that person's chosen to go to heaven, that person's not chosen. Well, they're almost saying that if you're not chosen, then God created you to go to hell. Isn't that a sad thing? When you, it's, it's, it's the truth. I mean, they may deny that, and they may look at you like, what are you trying to say? But that's the truth. It's, if you're on a ship, and the ship is sinking, and all the women get in the lifeboats, okay, and they're safe. All the men have to stay on the ship, and so the women will be safe, the, the men will sink with the ship. Are the men realizing, you know what, I'm, I'm chosen to die, right? Even though the women were the only ones chosen to get in the lifeboats, the men are chosen to die. You can't deny that, right? And the same way if Calvinism say that person's chosen to go to heaven, if you're not chosen to go to heaven, you're chosen to go to hell. It's just, it's, it's common sense. But anyways, 
In 1 Thessalonians 1 10, it says, To wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. So the wrath to come is talking about the tribulation wrath. In fact, read Ezekiel 38, verse 19. You'll write that down, Ezekiel 38, 19. It talks about that wrath. Um, right now, if you die, what happens to you? You know that 2 Corinthians 5 8 says you're absent from the body, you're present with the Lord, right? So if you die right now, you're in heaven. Your body's not. Your body goes to the grave. Your body will be taken up during the rapture. But right now, we're absent from the body, present with the Lord. Um, and so, even during, in Luke chapter 16, remember it talks about the rich man and Lazarus. And the, it says the, the Lazarus was taken to Hades paradise, which is with Abraham's bosom. And it says the angels took him there. You know, it's, and people, it says here, wait for, wait for his son from heaven. Jesus does not come and get you when you die. You're absent from the body, you're present from the Lord. At the rapture, he will come and get you, right? Because he comes and he gets those um, that are dead in Christ first, according to uh, 1 Thessalonians 4, then those that are alive and remain will be caught up, right? So the truth is, looking at this, the rapture only makes sense the way you interpret these verse. Now I believe that Hades um, paradise in Luke chapter 16 with the rich man and Lazarus, I believe that was emptied according to Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8. And that's why we say absent from the body, present with the Lord, right? Okay, so the next verse that I got is 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 9. I'm not going to go through all these, but it says here in 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 9, always remember to keep the Bible in context. And, and that, Carrie, I'm sure you're going to cover that when you talk about Philippians. But if you were to read verses 1 through 8 of Philippians, or 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, you're going to see it's talking about the tribulation. So it says here, for God has not appointed. Appointed means what? What? Set aside us to wrath. God did not create, as I said, hell for us. God created it for the devil and his angels. We choose to go there by not trusting his son Jesus but to obtain salvation. Now, salvation means deliverance by our Lord Jesus Christ. How are we delivered from the tribulation? By the rapture, okay? Right now, without Christ, you are a what? You are a chill child of wrath. Did you know that? Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1. Ephesians 2, 2 says you're a child of wrath. So right now, without Christ, your destiny is going to be hell because he came and died for it, and if you don't trust him, you're going to spend eternity in hell. But... Once you trust him, that wrath is removed. And the only other wrath there is is the tribulation, and you'll be taken from that wrath also at the rapture. So we understand that, to look at these literally for what they say, that the rapture makes sense. Romans 5, 9, I'm not going to spend much time on this one, because I think, I don't know if this one's a key verse that you can use, but it says, much more than being now justified by his blood, we should be saved from wrath through him. You look at the context there, I believe that's talking about salvation. I mean, you will not go to hell if you trust Christ as Savior, but the truth is, you're saved from wrath, be it hell or be it the tribulation. Really there. Hell is for or the devil and the angels. The tribulation there is wrath that's going to be poured out on Israel to get them to come to their senses whereas in one-third will be saved, and it's to be poured out on believers, which we call those that are earth dwellers. So in Revelation 3.10, this one I spent time studying, and there's different ideas on this, but I think it's pretty clear, the second half of this verse, but it says, Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, also will keep thee from the hour of temptation, which shall come upon all the world. There's never been an hour of trial that's been upon the whole world before, except for the flood, right? And so it talks to the church here that you're not going to go through this hour of temptation, which is that time of the tribulation, which is upon all the world to try them that dwell upon earth, the earth dwellers. That's to the church there in Revelation chapter 3, right? So, kept the word of my patience. There's two different ways of interpreting that. One is you're talking about Jesus, he, he endures. So he endures, we see that, and we trusted him as Savior. The other one is you and I as Christians, we're enduring this life right now and being patient because we're looking for him to come back. So he is going to come back, and that's just kind of something that we should understand here. Um, let's see if I want to cover any more on this, basically. So truthfully, um, 
you know, look in, in some verses in the Bible like Hebrews 11, 13, 1 Peter 2, 11, it talks about strangers and pilgrims, okay? Hebrews 11, 13, 1 Peter 2, 11. Now, we're strangers and pilgrims on this earth. We don't belong here. We're not going to stay here. We're, we've got a home in heaven. And so that strangers actually is the word parakos, and we're here living alongside everybody else, but this truly isn't on our home. Christ is going to take us to heaven. And so when it uses the word sojourners or foreigners there, you know, that's the word periperimos. And so we are basically here living on this earth as strangers, as pilgrims, and we are. We're foreigners. We don't belong here. We're aliens in that sense. You know, this is not our home. Yet sometimes people get really ground into this world and they don't want to hear this stuff in Revelation, what's going to happen to this world. And they got to realize, we're not going to be here forever. We're going to be out of here. So the truth is, it says there, He will keep you from the hour of temptation which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon earth. We'll be kept out of the tribulation. Um, let me go through just a couple more of these. Revelation 6, 17. As you see here is another one. It says, the, For the great day of his wrath is coming. Who should be able to stand? The great day of his wrath is a tribulation. We won't be through it. That's in Revelation 6. Revelation 6 through Revelation 19 is a tribulation. The church is never mentioned. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That's a nice way of saying die, but we shall all be changed. Now, on some churches, they put this at a nursery door. We will not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. But anyways, <laughs> behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Well, get our new bodies. Is, uh, who's excited about that? Amen, right? I mean, a new body. It's amazing. Then 1 Thessalonians 4, 15. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep, those that have died. So that's the rapture there in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I don't know how you can interpret that any other way. I mean, and then in 1 Thessalonians 4, 18, it says, Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The rapture is a comfort. You and I are pilgrims here. We're strangers here. Uh, but you know what? We're not going to be here forever. And we can comfort one another that God's going to take us out of here. And that's going to be absolutely amazing. Then 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6 through 7 tells us this. And now you know what withholds that he might be revealed in his time, the Antichrist, or the Holy Spirit. For the mystery of iniquity or sin does already work, only he who now lets will let until he be taken out of the way. We know there's like a half a dozen verses and more than that says when you trust Christ as Savior, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, right? Ephesians 1.13, Ephesians 4.10, uh, a couple of verses in Romans and so on, and even 1 Corinthians 13 something. But we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit is taken out of this world, we go, we're taken out of this world too. So that's when the Antichrist will be revealed. So 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 6 through 7, this Holy Spirit, through us hopefully, is preventing this world from going nuts, right? Did you, could you imagine if all true Christians were gone, that Satan would have a heyday with this world, do whatever he wants, because there would be nobody to say, hey, I'm going to prevent this because I'm going to vote for this candidate, vote for this candidate. It wouldn't be that possible anymore. Satan would, this would be hell on earth, wouldn't it? And that's when the tribulation is going to start. So the Holy Spirit, when it's removed, we're removed because we're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, I'm not saying that the Holy Spirit's not going to work during the tribulation time period, but I think he's going to work similar to the way he worked with Israel back in the Old Testament, okay? Now, here's 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 through 9. These are some examples that show you God spares his people. In 2 Peter 2, verse 5 through 9. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, right? Saved Noah in the ark. The eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly. Notice Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and who was in Sodom and Gomorrah? Lot was, right? And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them an example unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy combination of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelleth among them in seeing and hearing, vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation, and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So before God flooded the world, what did he do? He saved Noah and his family, right? In the ark. 
before he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, who did he, who, who did he save? Well, he, he saved Lot, tried to save his wife. She became a pillar of salt and the two daughters, right? And so God, re these are pictures in the Old Testament that we could say is similar to the rapture. God saves his people. Now, the interesting thing is Noah was a preacher of righteousness. It says Lot was righteous, but I think looking at it from the world perspective, we would not say Lot was righteous. He was righteous because he knew Christ, he knew the coming Messiah as his future atonement. But as far as his life, he was living right there with the people in Sodom and Gomorrah, and it was vexing his soul day to day. But because he was God's child, God delivered him. Do you see that? So I think you can build a very strong case that the rapture is a true doctrinal teaching in the Bible. And if people would study this and take the Bible for what it says, they would not go around and saying it's a dumb document that, or a, do, a dumb, dumb doctrine that people teach because they want to be escapists. In other words, you just want to escape this world. Well, yeah, I would love to get out of here. I don't want to go through the tribulation. I'm glad that I'm escaping hell because I trust that Christ is Savior. What am I going to be dumb and not trust Christ and allow myself to be cast into hell or, or want to go through the tribulation? I mean, seriously. Yeah, I want to get out of there, and I'm glad the Bible says this, and I interpret it what I believe literally for what it says, not because I'm trying to twist and interpret the way I want to interpret. I'm, you interpret it for what it says, and I think you come to the conclusion, God's going to remove his people before that seven-year tribulation. Okay, so that's a little brief covering of the rapture. Next, we're going to have our uh, apologetic, and this is about salamanders. And it's about complex information about evolution. So let's go ahead and watch this. Then we'll get into the book of Ruth. Evolution supposedly happened, changed bacteria all the way into human beings by adding information. Supposedly mutations, random changes to DNA happen, and if they're useful, allowing animals to survive better, then that animal changes into a completely different animal. But it doesn't work. The problem is, there is the survival of the fittest. God built that into creation so less fit animals don't survive. But evolution can never explain the arrival of the fittest, the arrival of new complex information. Let me give you an example. One of the things that's always promoted is, see this shows evolution happens, is the idea of blind cave salamanders. There's many creatures that when they live in totally dark, complete blackness of caves all their lives, they lose sight and even the next generation is born blind and, and, and they can't see. Well, this is an advantage in total blackness because in a cave, using part of your brain's capacity to try to see things when there's no light uh, is, is a disadvantage. So they say, see, this proves evolution. These animals evolved with an advantage in darkness. But let's think about that. Suppose you were in a movie theater with hundreds of people and one of those people is totally blind. They've been blind all their life and someone yells, fire! Everybody panics. Who of those hundreds of people is likely to survive and function in that total darkness best? The person who's blind. They have been that way all their lives. They can function in that atmosphere. In that very narrow, very unique environment, blindness is an advantage. But has it added information? Has it created anything new in that person? No, it's been a loss of information. All mutations are a loss of information that may have an advantage in a unique environment, but they don't advance a creature upwards. See, evolution, its very mechanisms, cannot explain where the variety of life came from. I guess the question would be, why would a blind person be in a movie theater? But <laughs> that's beside the point. <laughs> Okay. Anyways, it was just for his illustration purposes, right? 
So let's go ahead and look at the book of Ruth, verses 13 through 18, these six verses. We'll finish chapter 3. After this, we'll have two more weeks, I believe, in chapter 4, maybe three more weeks. But I uh, call this patience before blessing. And isn't that true for us also? Didn't we just talk about Revelation chapter 3, verse 10, being patient and we're living in this world, but eventually Christ is going to come back and deliver us from the tribulation before it starts. So we need to be patient also. But here, Ruth and Naomi were patient and waiting for God to do what he was going to do to bless them. So last week, Revelation, Revelation, Ruth, <laughs> i got to get Revelation out of my head. No. <laughs> Ruth chapter 3, verse 12, we finished it with, and it said in verse 12, and now it is true, this is um, Boaz saying, and now it is true that I am thy, that I am thy near kinsman, how be it? There is a kinsman nearer than I. So Boaz, I think Boaz and Ruth, I don't think it's stretching it too much to say that they were in love. Okay, I think they had affections for each other. And I think Boaz was a righteous person. He says, yes, I can redeem you. I'm your kinsman, but I can't do it unless I go to this other guy who has the rights first, okay? So the closer relative had the first choice of redeeming Ruth from that, okay? So here, in verse 13, it tells us this. It says, here's what he told Ruth when uh, she got woke up. Remember, she was sleeping on the floor with him in the, by the pile of uh, grain. And he says, now it is true that I, well, verse 13, tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform unto thee the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if you will not do the part of the kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of the kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. So in verse 12 through 13, how many times did you see the word kinsman there? I mean, I think Boaz has been thinking about this for a while. I want to be, I'm going to be the kinsman. And then when this happened with Ruth, he was ready for it, but he's got to go do it the right way. Um, it says here at the end of that verse, he made a vow in a sense. He says, as the Lord liveth, Lie down till the morning, okay? Basically what he's saying, yes, I'll do this. For, I will go ahead and redeem you. I'll be your kinsman. We will get married, but stay here, lie down, and in the morning, let's go ahead and get this taken care of. Now, here's the thing. He could have sent her home, but would she want to walk home in the dark of night? It wouldn't have been safe, would it? So he had her laid down by his feet there and to stay there throughout the night where she was going to be safe. So on the screen, you notice the word kinsman, which is that word gael. And gael means to redeem, act as a kinsman redeemer, avenge, ransom, to do the part of a kinsman. Now, in verses 12 through 13, that word kinsman is used six times. Actually, it's used seven, but you won't see that until I show you that. But it's used six times in verses 12 and 13. Now, that's a lot for two verses. Kinsman, that, that uh, he used, Boaz uses that. But then he goes on, it's, it says here, by marrying a brother's widow to beget a child for him, to redeem him from slavery, to redeem land, to exact vengeance. Basically, that's the idea of being a kinsman redeemer. He was going to redeem the family so that he would have a child and so that family would have a son, right? Um, continue with the family. Uh, so then in I think of this too also, and I think of, we have a kinsman redeemer of Christ, and we really do. I love what it says in Titus 2.14, who gave himself for us that he might redeem us back, buy us back from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We are to be a peculiar people. Have you heard on the political news them talking about these people are weird, these people are normal? And it's like these people on the left, they're all normal. And, and a vice president and his family, they're weird. But to me, there's something lacking there, isn't there? Because I see a lot of weirdness here and this being normal, but that's Isaiah 520. That which is evil is good and good is evil and so on and so on. Everything's backwards today in our world. But we are to be a peculiar people. We are. People look at it, they're different. They're peculiar. I mean, they're, 
You could say, if you want to call me weird, or if you want, call me weird. But anyways, he wants to purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. We as Christians. He gave himself for us to redeem us. So Christ did that for us. He's our kinsman redeemer, isn't he? And then Romans 3.24, the sign up here on the wall, says, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to go through this a little more in depth later, but justified means what? Declared righteous. Freely by his grace through the redemption to buy us back that is in Christ Jesus. Christ did all that for us. He redeemed us. And so this is what Boaz is going to do in the picture form that we look back and we see that this is what Christ did for us. But Boaz is going to do this for Naomi and by Mary and Ruth. Okay, so let's go ahead and continue on looking at verse 13 again. Let me read this verse again. Verse 13. It tells us, he says, Tarry this night, and it shall be in the morning that if he will perform unto thee, that's the other relative that's closer, the part of the kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman part. But if he will not, do the part of a kinsman to thee, then will I do the part of a kinsman to thee, as the Lord liveth, lie down until the morning. So he's putting it in God's hands, right? So he says, tarry this night. There's something interesting about this word. It means to lodge, to stop over, pass the night, abide. Ruth, stay here throughout the night because you'll be safe here. I'm not going to send you home where you're going to go walking home by yourself in the dark where some animal is going to get you. Okay? And that word there, loon, actually carries no sexual connotations, okay? If he wanted to use a word that carries sexual connotation, he would have used this word here, shakab, which means lie down. And we're going to see this word here in just a second. But shakab means to, lo to lodge or to lie, and it, ref it can refer to sexual um, relations. It's like saying, come lie with me. Now, the verse there, 2 Samuel 11, 4, you know who that's talking about, right? David and Bathsheba where he committed that sin with her. He told her, come lie with me, okay? So that's the word shaka. Now, how many of you ever heard this word? My dad always said this, when it talks about some guy moving in with a girl or, or vice versa, shacking up. I mean, I don't know if the younger generation's heard that, but I think most of us have, right? Heard that shacking up, you shack up with somebody, you go live with them. And when I read, seen that word shakab, I, that popped in my head for some weird reason, okay? And so, anyways, in verse uh, 13b, if you notice at the very end of that verse, he does say, um, lie down until the morning. He uses that word shakab. But we already know from the context that that's not talking about a sexual relation. It's because he already said, you know, you're going to stay with me and use the word loon to start off. But lie down, go to sleep here is what he's saying. Not, not in a sexual connotation way. So in verse 13, we see here, the kinsman, or the Gael, uh, is referred to five times in these, this verse here, in verse 13. And so, the book of Ruth actually uses that word kinsman 13 times. That's why when you think of the book of Ruth, you always think of this idea of being a kinsman, that, you're be, that Ruth is being, or Naomi is being redeemed because of this. That's why we use this book to mention about the kinsman redeemer. And so here he says, tarry this night. In other words, use the word loon. And it shall be in the morning that he will perform unto you the part of a kinsman. Well, let him do the kinsman part. That's twice. But if you will not do the part of a kinsman three times to you, then will. That word then will, if you looked at in the Greek, that's the word gael. So it actually could have been translated as kinsman. It could be if he will not do the part of a kinsman to you, kinsman, I would do the part of kinsman. So it's actually used there, um, what's that, what, five times in that verse instead of four. And then it says, part of a kinsman to you as the Lord lives. Then he says, lie down and stay with me. Okay, that's the same word David used. But here in this case, um, Boaz was not using the connotation of a sexual connotation because he was saying, stay with me, and she stays at his feet. Now, here's what the Jewish Talmud said, and that's the Jewish laws. They say that if a guy that could be a kinsman redeemer actually has a relationship with a female that he's going to redeem before they're actually married, um, that, that destroys the whole relationship, and it can't happen. So they had to be very careful here to maintain purity. So 
And he knew that and she knew that because they were people that believed in God and loved God and wanted to do what's right. So verse 14. In verse 14 of Ruth chapter 3, it tells us, And she lay at his feet until the morning, and she rose up before one could know another. In other words, it was pretty dark still when she got up. And he said, Let it be not known that a woman came onto the floor. So, if you see here in verse 14, where did she lay? At his feet, right? I mean, did the right thing. When did she get up? Very early because she wanted to get out of there before anybody would see her because you know how people would talk, right? The gossip. They wanted to make sure that they did this all right, the correct way, to be above reproach. They were cautious. Now the thing is, it uses that word floor there, in that verse, in verse 14, it talks about floor. It says, um, woman came onto the floor. That word floor, actually, if you look it up in the Greek, it's referring to a barn floor or a threshing floor, okay? You know, like in a farm, that type of floor. It's not referring to a, like a floor in a home or something like that. She was to lie there on that floor with him. By the, they, they pile up these uh, piles of uh, barley and they would lay by it to protect them throughout the night when they finished the harvest of the barley. Okay, so the barn floor or the threshing floor, uh, Ruth lied there at the feet of Boaz early in the morning. She got up and she was going to leave. And so I think there's something we can learn from this. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22 says, Abstain from all appearances of evil. So that's why we have to be careful with how we relationship and do things, right? That somebody can't look at us and say, hey, that looks like something not right. And there's many churches that ignore that altogether. And it causes troubles all the time, doesn't it? But we should abstain from all appearances of evil. Some things we do have liberties to do and stuff. But you know what? You always got to think about that younger Christian that's looking at you and watching you. If me doing this causes them to stumble, then we got to be careful, right? Because we should be able to deny ourselves a sacrifice for us ourselves for others and then I like the way this verse is said in what's called the Amplified Bible which Amplified C is the common edition or something like that and it says abstain from evil shrink from it and keep a low from it in whatever form or whatever kind it may be that's the way the Amplified Bible interprets it uh, for First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 22. And in Bible Gateway, that, that app that you can get on your phone or on your computer, you can choose all these app uh, translations that you use. That's one of them that you could use. Now, Chris and I went to a church for quite a long time, and they used the Amplified Bible on everything, and that was his, basically, commentary for teaching his church. That's not a wise thing to do, because you got to be careful. You know, you got to make sure you study and put your time in. You can't take that... For sure that when somebody takes and makes the Bible, the Amplified Bible, and adds all their commentary into it, that it's always correct, right? You have to look into that. you got to be careful. Okay, so how should we be? Philippians 4.8 is a wonderful verse. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. So it tells us there, stay true, stay honest, stay just, stay pure, stay lovely, and make sure that whatever you do, that it has a good report, you know, that people look at it and say, that's what they're doing is good. That's not questionable or something that um, it's best not to do. So you and I have to live above reproach, even though, you know, sometimes we say, well, why can't I go and do this and this and this, you know, we have to be careful because people are watching us, okay? So verse 15, and that's, that's really what um, Boaz wanted here in this situation with Ruth. He didn't want anybody to see that and to think, uh -huh, something's going on between these two. So he sent her home very early. And at verse 15, it tells us here, Also he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it, and when she held it, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her, and she went into the city. There's a couple things I see interesting in this verse, in verse 15. First of all, bring the veil that thou hast upon thee. And what is the veil? Is It's a wide cloak 
for a woman or what's called a wimple. How many, what's a wimple? You guys, any of you people know what a wimple is? You ever heard of that? Anybody? Okay. It must be a word that's been used long, long time ago. But the dictionary, that word translated here as a veil, in the dictionary it says it's a cloth wound around the head, framing the face and drawn into folds beneath the chin, worn by a woman in medieval times, okay? Um, but here's what the Hebrew dictionary says. And it says from the root, there in Genesis, uh, Revelation, Ruth 3.15, it refers to it. But this word is also used in Isaiah 3.22. And I'll show you that in just a second. But it says it's a spreading garment of a woman, a cloak. So I think it's more than referring to the head, head thing that we have in our dictionary. I think it's referring to like a cloak that's a larger type of cloth. Now it could be both, I don't know. But Isaiah 3.22 says this. A changeable suits of apparel and the mantles and the wimples and the crisping pins. So Isaiah 3.22 translated as wimples, whereas in Ruth 3.15 it translated as veil. It's the same word, okay? I, I've never heard of wimple before. For some reason, I don't recall reading that when I re read Isaiah before. I must have just skipped over it. And that's in the King James, okay? But, and here it says, he measured six measures of barley and laid it on here now calculating this out what they say that refers to like either like 60 to 100 pounds of barley put upon this this lady and it says it laid it upon her in other words boaz took this barley that was put in her wimple or her cloak and wrapped it up and put it on her shoulders told her to you know bend over and put it on her 60 to 100 pounds and then it says that she went into the city. So she had to carry all this stuff into the city. She probably was pretty tough, though, really. You know. But anyways, why does he say city there? Why doesn't it say, and she went home? I don't really know. Uh, could have been a closer route. It could be that he wanted her to be seen going through the city, and people would say, look what Boaz gave to her, and so on. Or to see his kindness. I don't know why, why it says city there. It could be just that, hey, in the city was where she lived because both of these people kind of lived grouped together, right, back in that day. So anyways, I don't know for sure on that, but he put that barley on her and told her to go home, take it to your mother-in-law. And so on verse 16, we'll look at here next. And so verse 16 of Ruth chapter 3. And when she came to her mother-in-law, she said, her mother-in-law said, Who art thou, my daughter? And she told her all that the man had done to her. So looking at that, verse 16, he says, She comes to the door and says, Tell me what happened or what, I don't know for sure. Is it that she knocked on the door and she came to the door and said, Who is this, my daughter? Is it my daughter at the door? Was she going to say, No, I'm the Maytag repairman? I mean, seriously <laughs> but knocks on the door and, or was she trying when what she was saying there was a idiomatic way of saying tell me what happened i want to know tell me tell me how'd it go with boy tell me tell me i want to know i don't want to know you know they were she's probably pretty angry i'm sure she stayed up all night wondering what is going on with ruth is she okay is what's going on with boaz and so she wanted to know so i see that maybe she knocked on the door and she wanted to know who's there and so on so i gotta think of some knock knock jokes Knock, knock, who's there? Water, water who? What are you doing today? Okay, you don't want too many of these, do you? Okay. Knock, knock, who's there? Weirdo, weirdo who? Where do you think you're going? And then, knock, knock, who's there? Boo, boo who? Don't cry, it's just a joke. I mean, seriously. Okay, so we had our fun. But anyways, <laughs> she told her all that the man had done to her, everything. Mom, look what I'm carrying on my back. Where do you think this came from? You think I worked overtime all night? You know, seriously? I mean, he gave me this, all this. It's for you. I mean, she saw this and she realized this looks pretty good. You know, this is a good picture. And then verse 17, she said, These six measures of barley gave he, Boaz, to me. For he said to me, Go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. He knew she's going back to the mother-in-law. Boaz knew that he was a relative to Naomi's husband, Elimelech, and he was going, wanting to redeem her, so that, I imagine for the rest of the night, 
Boaz probably didn't sleep, and I'll guarantee you, you know, Ruth didn't sleep either at all. And I'm sure Naomi was laying at home, staring at the ceiling, right, not being able to sleep, wondering what is going on here. But Boaz said to her, go not empty unto thy mother-in-law. And notice this, Boaz is also concerned about Naomi. Knowing what it means to be a kinsman redeemer, he wasn't really, it wasn't really Ruth. Ruth was married to Malon or the other guy, I can't remember the guy's name now. But anyways, the two sons, he was really a kinsman related to Naomi's husband, but he was going to redeem them through all this. So I'm going to show a video, a short little, like a two-minute video of this. And um, there's one thing I see in this video that, video that I believe is de definitely wrong. I want to see if you catch it too. Now, don't pick it apart because it's not perfect, okay? So, Sherry, remember the, the sock for him? <laughs> so anyways, let's watch this video. It's kind of cute. In the ancient town of Bethlehem, a captivating chapter of biblical history comes to life. The tale of Ruth and Boaz. Ruth, a widowed Moabite, returned to Bethlehem with her mother-in-law, Naomi, both grappling with profound losses. Faced with destitution, Ruth resorted to gleaning in the fields to provide for them. Fortune guided her to the fields of Boaz, a man of wealth and honor. Boaz, noticing Ruth's diligence and compassion, inquired about her circumstances. Learning of her unwavering loyalty to Naomi, Boaz extended his protection and generosity, instructing his workers to deliberately leave extra grain for her. Impressed by Ruth's character and moved by her commitment, Boaz took steps to redeem the family name and proposed marriage to Ruth. In a significant moment at the threshing floor, Boaz negotiated with a closer relative to transfer the responsibility of redemption, ensuring the welfare of Ruth and Naomi. Their union became a symbol of God's providence and the redemption that can emerge from unexpected quarters. The love story of Ruth and Boaz transcends time, leaving a legacy that continues to inspire generations with its themes of loyalty, kindness, and the profound ways in which God orchestrates extraordinary purposes through ordinary lives. Okay, if your last name doesn't start with a P, except if you're Tony. <laughs> no, you can't. Anybody see anything obviously incorrect there? Jason, what do you think? Said what? He said fortune brought her home. That was one. Yeah, okay. And then, uh, uh, well, actually, sorry, Ruth wasn't AI generated. Uh, <laughs> yeah, we don't know what she looked like. Okay. The, the clothing was wrong in particular. She didn't have another thing. Okay. That was one thing. Would it, the obvious thing. Anybody else get the obvious thing? Remember, what's that? Okay, but there's one thing they said there. Proposal? Yeah, they said he proposed, negotiated the proposal at the threshing floor. That's not where it usually works. You go back home and at the city gate is where you do the business, okay? And that's where that usually happens, okay? Um, in fact, you, you see the story of Lot and there's some other where we see this in the Bible that the, it's done at the city gate because when the guys go in and out, you see, hey, I got something to discuss with you. So I think that's the main one, although what you said is true and the others are true also. Okay, so verse 18 tells us this. And then said she, sit still, my daughter, until thou know how the matter will fail, fall, for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. So the next verse in verse chapter 4, verse 1 says, then went Boaz up to the gate and sat with him down there and beheld the kinsman of whom Boaz spake came by him unto whom he said, Ho, such a one, turn aside, sit down here. And he turned aside and sat down. So at the city gate, we're, we're talking about that next week. So you're saying, I gave you, asked you to guess something before we got there. But anyways, you're supposed to read ahead, right? Okay, so sit still, my daughter, and tell thou now. So, so did, did Ruth go home all giddy? It says, sit still, my daughter, until thou know the matter will fall, 
for the man will not be in rest until he have finished the thing this day. Okay, so there was a lot of excitement, I'm sure. And here's what's kind of cool. Naomi's prayer and Boaz's prayer are about to be answered. Remember back in chapter 2, verse 12, Boaz said, The Lord repay thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. Boaz prayed for Ruth. He actually is going to answer this prayer himself, by the way. But then remember what Naomi said back when they were still back in uh, Moab. Naomi said this, And Naomi said unto her two daughters-in-law, Go return each to her mother's house, the Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant you that you may find rest, each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed him, and they lifted up their voice and wept. So Ruth prayed for her two daughters, and this gets answered here. Not Ruth. Naomi prayed for her, prayed for her two daughters, and that prayer was answered for Ruth. So it's interesting that we see Naomi and Boaz both prayed for him. Um, we think of this that the Bible tells us we all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And I referred to that verse up there. Romans 3.24 says, being justified, declared, rendered righteous, freely. Freely means undeserved. It means for not. Now, how many, we, how many of us use the word not anymore? So that freely means, it means not is nothing. Sometimes we use it, right? But by his grace, through the redemption, that's the payment, the gael, that is in Christ Jesus. And as I mentioned earlier, Jesus Christ did this for us because he loves us. We're sinners, and he went and redeemed us, justified us freely by his grace. And that's something that's amazing when you think about this. And you see this picture of the love story in the Old Testament, and it's pretty cool. So next week, we're going to see actually what happens here with, with uh, Boaz and Ruth here in chapter 4 as we get there. Okay, let's go ahead and open up for prayers if you have your little sheets. Thank you.